Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Hasidus at the Artist Court of Minion here in Sfat, Israel. And we're very glad that you're here. The whole world is, isn't it? The whole world is about 7 billion people watching. I think it's about 8 billion people now. 8 billion people watching right now. Yeah, right. I think, I think the numbers have gone up recently, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I love it, you know, like when you see, like you want to download an app. So it's really cool because they put the numbers that when you like WhatsApp, it's like, Billion, you know, it's like unbelievable. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're learning a very, very interesting uh, sikha. The Rebbe, the Rebbe tells us about what's happening in Mashiach. So yesterday we discussed that when Mashiach comes, one of the great things that's going to happen is that we're going to have a new revelation of Torah. Now, this is a very, very important thing, actually. I was thinking of blogging it just before. Are you on my uh, WhatsApp group? Okay, good. So, so um, basically... Pretty much everybody makes the same mistake in life. And the mistake is, I was thinking this the other day, which is that there's an Oxford professor that wrote a book. Basically, the title of the book is And. Because people look in the world in terms of or, right? I'm going to do this, I'll be into like, I don't know, health, or I'll be like, I don't know, uh, into like, you know, whatever, eating whatever I want. Or I'll be an intellectual, or I'll just have a part, you know, Life is not built to be ors. Life is built to be ands. And one of the things that it says in the Kabbalah is God is Shlein Musa de Kula. And Shlein Musa de Kula is a very, very interesting word. I remember I was in South Africa and I had a very nice house, thank God. Um, and basically we had this guy, a really good guy, he was a German. He came to do our whatever, a pool service. And he tells me, God is a God of order. And I thought to myself, no. Germans are people of order, and you have created a god in a German image, right? So that's what we call anthropomorphization, that you take a quality and you assume that that's God, but God is every single quality at the same time, including any type of anything that can be a lack of quality, he's not there. So even if quality is a lack because you're stuck in being this quality, then that's not a quality anymore. So it's any kind of positive possibility in any way, shape, or form, infinitely. And that is God. So how do we imitate God? Is We don't imitate God by, let's say, saying, okay, well, this is the way it is, and that's that. You know, you'll have that in all kind of systems. We'll say, okay, this is reality, and that's that. Um, thank you, Shane. <laughs> so the, the, but the flip side is, no, we're... We're like we we're saying yesterday, you know, I asked my daughter Estelle when she was young, you know, what's the point of life? And she said, living. We're here to live. And in order to live, there are many details to life. And all those details are important. And the Torah tells us the best way for everything. I mentioned this the other day, I'm not sure if you were here, but basically there was a question, which is that you know, now we've kind of pretty much decided, unless you've been brainwashed by some kind of you know, radical um, disinformation campaign from Russia, which filtered down to the universities, that it's obvious that democracy, like Churchill said, democracy is the best form of evil called government. There is no better form until Mashiach comes where he'll be a leader, that he'll lead people according to the Torah and everybody will want to follow his leadership and he'll do things like the Rebbe says, Mashiach is a theocracy, is not a democracy, but it's not a theocracy that's imposed. Like Iran, he's a theocracy which people want Right, which is a very big difference. In any event, the main point is that a person has to look at each thing and assess what is the best way in this thing. So there are many, many different things. Generally speaking, there are like five basic things. You know, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Maslow was a very bright guy, Abraham Maslow, a Jewish psychologist, and he said. You know, Freud was studying sick people. He said, if you study sick people, you'll figure out how to be sick. But if you study healthy people, you'll figure out how to be healthy. So Abraham Maslow's whole thing was to go to successful people and to see how, what are they made up of. And that's his whole thing of self-actualization and doing good things. Um, so the point is that, you know, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have a couple of very basic things that all of us need. And the first thing is safety. We need safety. And safety is very important because you have a bunch of morons now going around the world saying, you know, defund the police. Well, you know, if you defund the police, now, 
just want to put this out there because it's important because some people think, oh, well, this is what black people think. No, that's not what black people think because if you look at the actual polls, 80% of black people want the police and 60% of black people want more police. So any normal, healthy human being wants to feel safe. Yes, the guy that's a gang leader doesn't like the police for good reasons, but that's not exactly what is normal. Normal people not only want, they need safety. Safety is a fundamental factor feeling safe, right? Now, ironically, feeling safe comes mostly from God. I write this in my book. Um, if anyone needs to put the phone on mute, feel free. But I write this in my book, which is that, you know, if somebody is, let's say, I don't know, ill, and you want to, this guy, I'm putting up the video soon, but it's really cool. So I interviewed this guy. So he had, unfortunately, cancer. It's not even that long ago, maybe 10 years ago or so. And he, um, basically, he was like kind of done for. And so his rabbi, who's actually my uncle, Rabbi Yitzchak Weinberg, is out uh, in Vancouver, Canada. He was living there. Said to him, why don't you write to the Rebbe? So he says, but the Rebbe is not alive. He says, no, it's Sadiq is alive. Write a letter. He wrote a letter and he took it to the old Rebbe's graveside. And listen to this story. It's an amazing story. As my uncle put the letter by the Rebbe's grave, he heard a voice say to him, Zai Gesund. Zai Gesund means be well. Zai Gesund. So he thought to himself, that's it. God talks to me. He's got two words to say. Is that like the best you can do? And he said he felt, he said this wasn't a voice that he heard, but he felt inside, in your case, it means a lot. And he actually got over cancer and he went to his doctor and his doctor said, his doctor was a Jewish surgeon and his doctor said, thanks for the heart there. His doctor said, um, he says to his doctor, I want to make a Leah to Israel. So what do you think? So his doctor said, go ahead, go to Israel. There you'll be plugged into the God's energy. You'll be fine. And that's what happened. He came to Israel and the guy is like from literally from, you know, he's fine. So first of all, Hashem should do a miracle. You know, we're in a very um, interesting time. So is there a Chinese course? You should live in interesting times. And effectively speaking, um, we are... Um, you know, facing, facing, I put out a video this morning, which was, um, I started to analyze the whole situation. So the only thing that's going to help us is God, because even the Republicans, nobody's taken out Iran. Even Israel hasn't done that. And these guys are, they're armed and they're dangerous. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing because Hashem, you know, it says before Mashiach comes, we'll say there's no one to rely on but God. You think about the Jewish people. What was our situation? We were literally at the sea with the Egyptians at our heel. And so we have to realize that we're literally in that time whereby um, I feel the reason none of the Western governments have really taken out Iran is because um, I once met this lady, a very interesting woman. She charges $1,000 an hour as a lawyer. She never lost a case. And um, for those looking for legal advice, her basic thing was like, just like, look like you're the good guy. And then she told me she read this thing from a samurai warrior, like in Japanese, which is like from one word, you can see a thousand. And from one sentence, you can see a thousand. So sometimes you just have to pick up on a word or two here or there, and you, you understand what's going on. So what's going on um, is basically the West is being blackmailed. And so, so you know, Iran, in whatever way, shape, or form, has various abilities um to to create mass casualties and they're like if you take us out we're going to do this so basically as they call it they're kicking the can down the road they're not dealing even hezbollah right everybody knows that you have to deal with them and they're probably going to deal with them soon which is why it might be a good idea to have uh, another spot in israel to hang out for in a while but in any event the story is that the truth is I heard that Sansa Rebbe said Tzfat is the safest place in Israel and we do see that we're very protected here we're very safe thank God but the bottom line is that it's like a similar situation where the leaders of the world don't have the moral courage to do what they have to do they haven't done that in 70 years I mean maybe some I'm too young to know um, but basically you know, I guess in the World War II, they got so sick of the, you know, Japanese, they dropped a couple of nukes. Um, and they had the moral courage to do what they had to do. Uh, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of, I don't know if you know this, but when I think it was Eisenhower, who was a general, 
became president, there was a North Korean war. The way that war stopped was he told Japan that for every day that that, no, he told China that was helping North Korea for every day that it continues, we're going to bomb one of your, we're going to nuke one of your industrial cities. It stopped like the day he became president, right? So Ronald Reagan, the Iran thing basically stopped. But what people don't know, I saw this from an admiral, you could see it on the on YouTube where there was an admiral of the Navy that there was uh, basically that Ronald Reagan had given orders to take out the Ayatollahs and the Department of Defense, whatever's going on there, stopped it, right? So we wouldn't have any Iranian problems. So there are forces that are evil that are, that are, that are, you know, perpetuating what's going on. Um, and, and effectively, um, from that perspective, there is no human hope except for Hashem. And so when we actually understand that, we understand that Hashem is the only thing to rely on, this is really why I'm saying it, because I'm not trying to freak anyone out. But it's because when you get to that point, then you put your trust in Hashem. And it says that whoever you put your trust in is where you get your salvation from. So if you're putting your trust in President Trump, so he was the president, but he didn't do it. And with all due respect to Netanyahu, he's been the prime minister for a long time, and he never did it either. So like the only one we can really trust in is Hashem, because the only one that's actually going to save us is Hashem. And we encourage Hashem to do that now. You know, there are hostages. It's insane what's going on. And my wife mentioned this to me the other day. She's like, you know, this is four hours away from us. It's not like a different country, four hour flight. Like you could drive into Gaza. There's a Jew sitting in a tunnel as we speak right now. This is very bad stuff. So Rabbi said that um, a couple of interesting predictions from the Rebbe, which was that before Mashiach comes, we'll have boots on the ground in Syria. Because really what we're dealing with is we're dealing with um, Arab hatred. That's really what it boils down to. It's interesting that Medrash says that because the Arabs came from Israel, so they were banished, Yishmael was banished. So, and in fact, it says that, that Yishmael went to Arabia and Avram Avinu visited him in Arabia. So it's very interesting. This is a 4,000 year old story. Um, and so they have this, this insane like jealousy and desire for Israel. But the thing is that jealousy only works when you're arrogant. Right. So jealousy is, let's say you have, I don't know, you got a cool pair of glasses there. And I say, oh, wow, I want that pair of glasses too. But so the Torah tells us, for example, not to be jealous. So the question is, how are you not jealous? Let's say it says, don't be jealous of just using the example of another man's wife. So let's say there's a pretty woman and I know you're jealous. So it gives the example. Let's say a prince marries a princess. You wouldn't say, oh, wow, I wish I married her. Why? Because you're not a prince. You don't have any connection to it. So the same thing is that if you understand whatever belongs to somebody else, like the Arabs have no connection to Israel. It's, God gave them a, a lot of land. They're not missing land and oil. We have this tiny strip of land. Go get, you know, go be happy in your own place. So the point is, when does the person change? They change when they're humble. Because jealousy is predicated, if anyone needs to put the phone on mute, please feel free. Jealousy is predicated on um, basically entitlement, right? I can only be jealous of something that I'm entitled to. So if I'm, I don't know, just to give an example, I'm an employee and um, the bank promotes one of the employees to make the manager. And I'm jealous of this guy. Why? Because I am an employee too. Why did he get to be the manager? I could have been the manager. But if I'm just like, I don't know, the, 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 the cleaner in the bank and somebody's made a manager, I'm not going to be jealous of him because I'm not in, I have no sense of entitlement that is similar to this person. It's very interesting. There are studies with monkeys, very cute, where you'll see like if you put two monkeys in a cage and you give them both a cucumber, they're like, they're cool. And then you give one a candy and one a cucumber, the guy that gets the cucumber goes ballistic. He like throws his proper tantrum, throws a cucumber there. Because he's like, okay, I understand you're a human being, you're eating a candy, I'm not a human being. But I'm a monkey. If that monkey got a candy, why can't I get a candy? The same thing as with little children. If you give a little child, I don't know, two cucumbers, that's fine. But give one little kid at the table candy and the other cucumber, go see what happens. So the point is that jealousy is predicated on a false understanding of reality. And this is very interesting about this guy that I was speaking to today. It's that he, he was a prisoner. He was literally like a slave for three years. Now, we're not talking about a person discussing the idea of jealousy. So the point is that um, 
Now, jealousy is, is based on entitlement, right? So I'm entitled. Now, the entitlement is actually quite important because a person doesn't feel totally entitled at all. Like they have studies with these babies from uh, Romania that they were in these orphanages and they uh, didn't have love. And then actually children really need to feel entitled because that's when they we develop our ego. Our ego is developed through entitlement. So then our ego has to be balanced. Um, as I put out today, that you know the ultimate is to to un, have an identity that I'm, in essence, God, and then the ego is a good thing because then you're expressing God. Ego is only a bad thing if, if what you're expressing is bad. But if what you're expressing is good, ego is actually good. So the idea here is that um, with the Arabs, they have this, this. So you find that when a person has humility, right? So and this is why it's interesting because various Arab countries have actually made peace with Israel or are working on peace with Israel. Why? Because there's something called the Arab winter. Some people call it the spring, but it was actually the winter, meaning they, they went in these massive civil wars. So they began to realize that, hey, we're our own problem. The problem is that, you know, places like Syria haven't gotten that message yet because, they, you know, Assad is still in charge and he feels powerful. And then you have places like... Um, um, you know, the, 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 the Hamas, I mean, these places, because whenever you're going to get a, a, a radical Muslim group, like, they just look at the world as like, if we didn't get our way, we have to be more radical, because it's everything's about religion to them. So that's actually how you have the Muslim Brotherhood, because it started about the 1920s, which, um, according to some newspaper reports from Egypt, Obama was part of, which makes a lot of sense, because he supported them. And also, they're about putting people, there are people in position of power. A lot of people don't know this, very interesting. I heard this from somebody that worked on the McCain. Who paid for, why did Obama not release his um, education records? Because who paid for it? Saudi Arabia, they paid for his college. So he was, he was on the grooming list of people that were being groomed to get into American politics in order to corrupt the, you know, to use their, basically to do, which of course, it doesn't even work ironically for the countries like Saudi Arabia, because we're finding that they're becoming more pro-Israel. Why? Because in the end of the day, radicals want total, um, you know, totalitarian control. They don't care about anyone or anything. You know, there's this guy who's a radical in an Egyptian prison, and he read Animal Farm, and he basically left radicalism because he realized, yeah, that's true. That's who we are. Like, we don't care about the people at all. And so, you know, what the world has to realize is that we're facing um, a, a um, I was, my wife was listening to this guy the other day, you know, you saw, you ever saw that guy, son of Hamas? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's pretty good. So he was saying, like, he was talking to university students, so he was saying, listen, Israel's a system. So it's a democratic system. Now, is it perfect? He says, no human system is perfect. But compare that to Hamas. Hamas is a savage beast that is 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 you know how do they build those tunnels with slave labor you know they're, they're they torture their people they're they're evil and so the point is that you know there's this kind of cultural thing to look at all people in a beautiful way which is making me feel good but it's not making the people that are subjected to those people feel good so in fact israel and the west is guilty of 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 creating these regimes right so who basically created the Palestinian Authority, um, or who actually made it happen, was basically America. They're the ones that pressured Israel into giving them territory, giving them a state. Israel is wrong for accepting that pressure. And Israel is wrong for withdrawing unilateral from a part of Israel. Like, who gives up a unilateral part of the country? You've got to be insane. But be that as it may, who put the pressure on them? America. So what's going on here? What's happening? And the answer is that basically we're stupid. You know, there's a guy that wrote a book. He said it's 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 called the Secret War Against the Jews. He was a he was a a, a special prosecutor, and basically people don't know this, but I think it was actually mainly the Republicans. This is going back, but after the war they brought in Nazis that were scientists to work on their like bombs and different things, which is quite well known. But he realized that there was like this whole thing going on, which was like you know against the Jewish people or, or like because the CIA was really created by the Dulles brothers who were like into the oil. So there's a very strong connection between the oil, which is the Arabs, which are anti-Semites and the CIA. So there's this whole like this ugly 
ugly, like, 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 like satanic stuff, which a lot of it is a guy, Mike Bickle, who wrote a book. I forgot the name of the book, but he like overheard a conversation somewhere like in Geneva. It was like, in five years, you'll have a Palestinian state. And because they were behind the scenes, they were just pressuring, 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 which is why Israel gave. But what does America gain? So it's not America's gain. It's basically just some rich people getting a little richer from oil. That's the only thing that's being gained here. But ultimately, um, I don't know if it's true. You can't believe everything on the internet. But I did see that the CIA gave the, the plans for the for the what's it called for the for the nuclear reactors in in Iran. You know, if that's true, that's pretty bad. So the point is that we're dealing with like this tremendous. There's a line from Karl Marx. He says, I mean, I, of course you can't buy into his philosophy, but there's something that he says is true. He says the capitalist will sell you the rope to which that will hang him. In other words, you have to use your head here. You can't just say, oh, we can do whatever we want because we're powerful. What power today doesn't mean the guy can't bomb you tomorrow. And so getting back to the original subject, which is the idea of God, who's going to save us because that's the only hope. So the Rebbe says that we're going to actually have to go into, um, and he was very into this, the Kabbalah speaks about it, we're going to go into Damascus. Why? Because it's just arrogance. You know, why are they supporting hatred of the Jewish people? I mean, you got enough problems on your own hands, like South Africa. I lived in South Africa a long time. These guys are telling Israel morality is like the rape and crime capital of the world. But the answer is because if you give a slave power, he goes out of his mind. So you give these people power and they just lost their minds. You know, I mean, the, the president, Zuma, he was a president. He like spent 10 million rand, okay, maybe it was like $3 million on a wall. And it was like an outer perimeter wall. I mean, the, the whole thing is just insane. And so when a person becomes humble, then suddenly, you see, and I lived in Africa, so it's very interesting, the, the humble black people there are the nicest people in the world. Why? Because they're humble. People that are humble, like even a child, they're very sweet because they're humble. So this is really um, the, the thing that's going to happen and has happened in a way to the Arabs, which is God will humiliate them and in that humiliation, they will become normal people. And in fact, this is happening to Iran. They're not really getting the message. You know, they, they threatened Israel with an earthquake. Three days later, they had an earthquake. And the president and the foreign minister, a whole bunch of people got smacked. Their helicopter, like I've never heard of such a story in the last 70 years, in a mountain. So we're talking about Hashem is really giving them a sign. And the Rebbe actually said this, that it was a previous earthquake in Iran. Like Hashem is trying to tell them, like, wake up. This is like your behavior is not okay. You're creating chaos. God wants, when Napoleon came here into Israel, actually could have been in Sfat itself. Maybe it was, I think it was maybe in Sfat or something. The soldiers that came and they were, because he got kind of to the north and they tried to rob in like a capitalist's house. And, and he like said some words and they froze. So Napoleon heard about it. It was like, Napoleon was a very smart man. And he, he, he asked the capitalist to come to him. So he came to him. He said, will you maybe just join my team? Like, in fact, he was a black magician, Napoleon. And so the capitalist said, God has given you tremendous like abilities. You have to use it for peace. Because the whole point of life is creating peace and order and creating. And that's why the world is created. The world is created for us to have a a good dwelling. And that's why the nations of the world are obligated to create law and order. So we're in this final battle, which basically boils down to like three different cultures are battling as we speak right now. The first battle is a battle between basically, if you want to call it Judeo-Christian ethics, God, and, and, and effectively um, hedonism. You know, that's an internal battle that's going on within the Western world, that many people are connected to God. I would say most people, but there's this also, this like Yetzirah, which is like this hedonistic, like selfish, anarchist, you know, thing going on. And that's kind of people have to choose between that. And the other battle that's going on is a battle that's been going on for a long time. It's between basically savage Islam against the rest of the world, particularly against the um, Christian world, so to say. Um, the rebel was once speaking, you know, and he was saying like, they hate America more than they hate the Jews. They call the Jews the little Satan in America, the big Satan, right? Because 
So, so their hatred of, of America is total. The fact that we can like, you know, like we can have any, any giving them any support, like America's giving PA money, these like unbelievable. Like these are the people that are taking American citizens and holding them hostage as we speak right now. So it's like, it's sick. The whole thing is sick. The Democratic Party has completely been brainwashed. It's unbelievable. And I mean, even worse is you've got people like in Google and all these people that have tremendous power and influence that are, that are supporting this. Anyway, it's a separate subject. So the one is this kind of God war going on internally. The other is this war, which is the only reason, you know, Islam didn't take over the world is because they were militarily stopped what was it, Charmelaine, or I forgot who it was, like somewhere like I think in, in France or something. But they, if they had the power, they would have taken over the world, and they never stopped that desire. So there's this, like, you know, the, this Turkish guy, all these guys that believe in Islam using force against the world. And what a lot of people don't realize is that this has morphed into a third type of jihad, which a lot of people don't know about. And that is that, because in Islam... Basically, you're going to go to hell unless you do everything perfectly, or if you do jihad, jihad is your ticket to heaven. And so, but there's another kind of jihad, and that's kind of a, a cultural jihad, which is you can move to a country and bring Islam to the country. So that's what's happening in Europe today. And a lot of people don't realize that that's what Obama did to America. He basically brought in all these radicals. So who are these people that are protesting? These are the people that Obama brought in. And this was a very intentional thing that they did. And that's why the, he created this whole thing of letting in quote unquote refugees, which with anybody that lets in anybody into the country, anybody needs to put the phone on mute, feel free. Um, anybody that lets anybody into a country without checking their borders, you know, you've got to be insane. And so the, the bottom line is it's an intentional program to destroy the West from within. And, um, in the end of the day, I would say the, there's the third battle that's going on. And the third battle is really, it's almost um, kind of within the Jewish people themselves, which is similar to the um, kind of hedonistic battle, which is between God and the hedonistic side. So it's not that different, but in a certain sense, it's, it's, it's nuanced because the Jew has a, a we have a Yetzirah. And if we get our stuff right, then the world really will come right. And so it's a very big obligation to each one of us, certainly here, certainly anyone listening, to do everything as perfect as possible, be your best self, because ultimately the real spiritual influence is coming from us. It's like, like on a spiritual level, the Jew is like the kind of, the, once the person was asked the Rebbe, what is a Rebbe? So the Rebbe said that a Rebbe, he gave an example, he said that, Imagine New York, there's a, um, there's a uh, you know, there's lights all over the city. And all the lights come from a power station. In the power station, there's one switch. The Rebbe is the one that switches that light on. So we're the ones that switch on the light of the world. There are 10 sayings by which the world was created. And there are 10 of the 10 commandments. And we are the ones that have to actually, by keeping our faith, we energize the, the kind of the Torah is the blueprint of the world. So by us keeping the Torah, we're putting in the energy of the world. So we have a tremendous duty, um, you know, and uh, we've mentioned before, it's the merit of the righteous Jewish women that bring Mashiach, like the mitzvahs, and the mitzvahs are not easy to keep, you know, but all these mitzvahs that we do, which mainly is in the head, like, is it that difficult? But we're worried, what is someone going to sh say? Shame is like the big thing that, that hits us. It's like, you know, suddenly you're so worried about what everyone else is going to say. But somehow when it comes to doing a mitzvah, we're very worried. What's the other person going to think? If they think I'm crazy, they think I'm normal, right? It's not like anyone thinks we're normal anyway. I remember this guy, he, he, uh, he became religious. So I forgot the exact details of the story, but I went to a certain school that his son went to, and he was asking me about the school, and I was a little cultish, the school. So I said to him, oh, yeah, I think they want to try to be like a little normal. He says, listen, I did not become religious and put on a beard to be seen as a normal human being. Right? That's not what had happened here, right? So, so particularly actually Jews that have that that have embraced Yiddish guy, like we're doing it, and that's why Moses, when he looked into the future and he saw our generation, he was most impressed of our generation, because our generation overcomes the hardest trial, which is shame. 
Because people, they say the thing that people are most afraid of is speaking in public, even worse than death. But you got to admit that probably speaking in public shouldn't be as scary as death. However, what are people worried about when they speak in public? They're worried about being shamed. So it shows us that shame is such a strong worry and people overcome that. Even somebody that converts, you have to love them very much. It says like a deer that's very afraid, deer have, they're very skittish. But they came and they joined the Jewish people. So you have to really embrace them because they've overcome so much just to join God. And so we really have to respect somebody that's about children and somebody that's, you know, a gear because they've really put their money where their mouth is in a very, very, very serious way. I mean, just yesterday I was dealing with a girl. She came, whatever, long story short. But, like, it's unbelievable, a college student, what they have to go through and, like, just being a normal Jew and, you know, being a Zionist, like the friends that people think, I mean, you've said this yourself, suddenly you're losing friends, you're losing all this stuff because, but it does show in a lot of strength of character, like, no, this is the truth and I'm going to do the truth, you know? So we have to have a lot of respect for our fellow Jews here that are conservative or that are normal because it is a tremendous, like the easiest thing in the world is to just join what the, 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 the shouters are saying, right? But you're not showing strength of character. What made a Jew a Jew, what made Abraham Abraham is because I say a Jew is somebody that seeks the truth, is willing to live by the truth, and even suffer for the truth. Because that is what makes us Jewish. That's what means to be a Jew. A Jew is a person who's literally um, putting his money where his values are. And that's really our job in this world. In fact, it's interesting because if they say that when we get to heaven, um, they show you scenes of things that you did, and but you don't know it's you. You think it's someone else, and they ask you to judge the scene. Somebody goes through a red light. What do you think? You're like, oh, well, that's terrible. Like, well, that was you. So in fact, God doesn't really judge us. We judge ourselves. So it's very important to be in a positive judgment state, always looking at people in a positive way. Because if we do that, then we can really bring Mashiach because we're, we're, we're putting the energy in the world. This guy, very, very smart guy that we have in town, he told me something really interesting. He said that, you know, quantum physicists say, and there's a very great rule of quantum physics today, that everything is energy. And what makes energy is consciousness. So consciousness makes energy. And so if that's the truth, he says, all we need to do is improve our consciousness and we'll have the right energy. And that's really what my book, Kabbalah Love, is all about, getting out of fear and into love. And that's the whole thing. The side of God we see about the Rebbe and Hasidus is all about joy and happiness and faith and trust and doing good. And it's all positive. And then the side of negativity all boils down to fear or giving fear. Even terrorism, what does it mean? It means to terrorize. Why? Because people that are feeling the fear are jealous of the people that are not feeling the fear. So they do things to criticize in order that the person should not feel safe in order that they should feel fear of criticism. And this is the challenge of life, which is to understand that anybody that's criticizing is just jealous. That's all it is, it's just jealousy. And if we can get that, then we won't fear it, because we only fear criticism if we take it serious and we think it's real and it's true. But if we knew that it's not true, for example, Jews don't really get affected by anti-Semitism, because we know that the anti-Semite is not real. The story of a guy, a very special guy that was uh, in the Holocaust, a super strong guy, and um, he was a block commander and he really helped Jews there. But um, he, had a, he had some people, their, their, their tongues said when he came to Israel that he was a capo. Capos were not the best Jews, that they <coughs> kind of worked for the Germans, and not that they didn't get killed either, but they had a little bit of privileges and, and they kind of kept order, this and that. It was like a policeman, but unfortunately for the Germans. So, um, and the story is that that this guy who he saved and he managed to come here said that what the Germans couldn't do to his body, Jews did to his soul. That he like he like he was so hurt by this, by being called a capo, that he like he kind of got depressed and died. And so the point is that that that's where 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 our our sensitivity to others have to has to be complete. And this is really the essence of Judaism, which is it says when somebody came to Hillel and said. Um, what is the essence of Judaism? So he said, that which you don't want someone else to do to you, don't do to them. The rest is an interpretation. Sorry, the rest is an explanation. So the question is, why would you say that? Judaism says, do to others this, this, that. But actually the main thing that we don't want is we don't want to be shamed. So never shame another person.
We don't have a right to shame people. In fact, there's a mitzvah of the Torah that many people don't know. It's called a no'as devarim. Everybody knows it says don't steal. But it also says don't hurt somebody with your words. And so we have to be very, very sensitive because often what happens is when we're hurt, we then feel entitled to hurt. Because it happened to me, why can't it happen to you? You know, there's a comedian that has this whole thing about this kid that gets hit by a snowball, but the snowball is really a slush ball and it's got ice. And he's like, ah, that's not fair. You did a slush ball. Bah, bah, bah. He's like, and then they're like, yeah, let's go hit someone else. He's like, oh yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> you know, so there's this, you have to have this sensitivity. And that's really what Yiddish guide is all about, which is creating positivity and joy and love and sensitivity and compassion versus the other side, which is about arrogance and anger and hate. And that's the two sides. And if you stripped it away from all its language and all its mitzvahs, and you just looked at it pure emotions. So this is the emotional state you want to be in. And that's the emotional state you don't want to be in. I learned something really interesting from the Baal Shem Tov today. He says like this. He says, you have to learn from everybody. So he says, what? You're going to learn from, I don't know, a wicked person? He says, yeah. From a good person, you have to learn what to do. From a wicked person, you have to learn what not to do. So if you see something that's bad, you have to realize that this is an opportunity to repent because you could look at it. There was a chasa by the name of Mendel Futafas. Mendel Futafas never wore a tie because once he saw a person working so hard on his tie, and he was like, oh, this is not for me. And so anything you see is there to teach you a lesson. Everything in the world is there to teach you a lesson. And so if you see something positive, it's to emulate it. If you see something negative, it's to say, wow, I don't like that behavior. I don't want to be in that behavior. So if we think for a moment, this is very, very critical, the midst of the Torah to emulate Hashem, which is also to emulate the tzaddikim. Think about the great tzaddikim. And if you think about them and their behavior and what they did, you know who you have to emulate. And if you think about the wicked people in the world, actually that's good, because now you know who you don't want to be, who you're not going to emulate. So it take, puts you away, it takes you away from that kind of behavior. Um, so just in conclusion for today, um, I just want to continue a little bit uh, from the subject that we were learning, which is about Mashiach. We spoke about the idea of um, Mashiach is going to teach us Torah, and we spoke about the idea that Mashiach is going to be a, um, a theocracy, but one that people want. We're going to see him as a leader. That There's a difference between a dictator that imposes and a leader which people desire. And he says like this about Mashiach. Velashen chazal miyosadal pasuk yitayr miititetzei shenemer biyudi agula tayr chadash miititetzei. A new Torah will come from me. Chidush tayr miititetzei. New chidushim, new ideas of the Torah. Asa de kaz baruch liyos yoyshe bedarish tayr chadash asa litin aydei b'shiach. Hashem will be giving us a new Torah um, through Mashiach. Now, what does that mean? Not that the Torah will change rather that Mashiach will give us the great secrets that are buried in the Torah, they're there. And one of the things that Mashiach will do is he'll show us ideas that nobody saw before in the Torah. And that's a little bit what Chassidus is doing. We're already living in Mashiach times. So we have to like realize this. There was a great Chassid by the name of Rashbaz. He was a teacher in Tehrim, the primary school of Chabad. And he told them, like, we would run to hear one vart of Hasidus, one little line. It was, like, so precious to us. He says, you guys, you're like little piglets swimming in, like, the, the mud. And, like, you don't appreciate what's going on here. Like, we don't appreciate what we have. The Torah that we have, people would have killed for. 500 years ago, wasn't even revealed. We talk about great saints, great scholars, but this just didn't come down into the world yet. So the world has a process of revelation. It begins in darkness, which basically, you know, becomes a man eat man world and then it becomes a Ramavin and becomes a Torah you get more and more light but now we have Hasidus we have this new Torah which is incredible insights incredible inspiration the Chai oh I should do a meditation <laughs> so we'll do a little meditation okay so first of all let me take a drink of water let's do a meditation hopefully this meditation will increase the frequency the positive energy in the universe We'll bring about a time that we'll all be in such a positive frequency that there will be no more need for anything. Mashiach has a great landing spot. So, so uh, let's breathe in and breathe out. <coughs> breathe in Hashem. Breathe out all of your worries and your fears and your inhibitions. Breathe in truth. 
You breathe in peace. You breathe in love. Let go of negativity. And imagine a world in which everybody loves themselves. We were speaking before about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. One of them is having a good image of yourself. Imagine that you're loved by everyone in the world, by everything in the world, by every being in the world, all the billions and trillions of angels, and certainly by the creator of the world who loves you. And feel, imagine love being a fluffy blanket. Let it cover you. Let it embrace you. And imagine that everyone just loves you. And feel loved by God, and loved by the angels, and loved by the tzaddikim, and loved by people, loved by the plants, and the animals, and the trees, and the physical things. Just feel love. Because the real frequency of the world is love. It's a sense that we are all really like each other. We all have a soul, we all have emotions, we all have the desire for knowledge, of meaning. So we're all really the same. And now let's think about the great Sadikim that we need to emulate people like Avraham Avinu, who's just looking for the truth and opens up a free hotel to teach about Hashem and help people. His wife, Sarah, that helps him. Yitzchak and Yaakov and Rachel and Leah and Moshe and Sipara. And in our modern times, we have the Rebbe and the Rebetzin. And so many good people. Think about all the good people you know. People that know how to stand up for what's right in a positive way and to love positively. And also be disgusted by evil, the arrogance of the Germans, of the terrorists, of the left, really, of professors, of people that are just, you know, in the media that are just really just sowing stupidity and bad ideas. And, and when we are disgusted, we turn away from negativity and we embrace the tzaddik and we embrace the love, we embrace what's good. And let's make a very powerful resolution because in life, there are basically only two ways to live. And one is constructive and one is destructive. We were speaking about this the other day that God made the world of evil and opposite to the world of good. Just like the world of good, there's pleasure, there's pleasure in evil. And so we have great pleasure in construction, in building, making things better. But likewise, there's a kind of a sadistic pleasure in destroying. And those people that lose the pleasure of love, or even if have the love but are not focused enough on building, on creating, we're here in this world to make it better. So eventually from fear, as Yoda said, the path to the dark side is fear, can join the darkness and become part of the basically sadistic people. People don't realize what they're protesting <laughs> against Israel, which is the most compassionate, and for the enemy, which is the most cruel. So this shows what's happened to the Germans, the people that are not choosing the life of goodness can easily fall because in between construction, destruction, love and hate, it's kind of a no man's land of like, I don't have an opinion. And so then you, they say that unless we stand for something, we can fall for everything. And so let's be very, very strong in our opinions we're good people, we're kind people, we're followers of Hashem, and we're not bad people. We're not people that believe that we can tell the world, force the world into our way, even if Islam told their ancestors it's not right. Nobody would want to be forced. Like we say, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. You wouldn't want someone to force you to be a Christian or something. So you can't force them. If you have something to say, you know, part of the insanity of jihad today is that, okay, even if you want to speak about it, that there was a religious obligation on Muslims to kill, let's say, to take over a country for Islam. But that would only be if the only way you could do it is that. In fact, according to Judaism, there's a law of forcing people to do the seven Noahide laws in Israel. But you're not allowed to force somebody that you can talk to, right? If maybe somebody, but if, so, so the world is an open place. Everybody's welcome to come with their brand of religion and convince anyone. And if a person, doesn't feel that the religion has what to sell in the open marketplace of ideas, and they're following it, then they're an idiot. Why are you following something that you can't even convince somebody of? It means that you yourself don't even believe what you're saying. So it's just a radical idea that you've been imposed upon because your father, because somebody 
basically put them to the sword or, or, or Islam, and then that's what you're following. And so you're stuck in this nonstop and basically perpetual evil because you're not willing to, to say, why am I following something that I don't even think that a rational person, unless some, I don't know, murderer in, in jail, only he's going to buy into this religion. That's a sign that the person's not even respecting their own religion. So in conclusion, um, let's be very careful in who we follow and follow only the Hashem, the Siddiqim, the Torah that has a good positive advice and really be disgusted by the negative because if we're disgusted, we stay away from it. And the part in us that likes it will, will, will recoil in disgust. And now we're going to come out of the meditation in a three and a two and a one. If there's any questions, anybody have any questions? Yes. I mean, this is really taking it off this. So you switched the, you switched it around to the positive, and I'm, I'm not sure where I'm reading this to, but I read also even on like things like Chabad org and stuff about the um, Ishma exile or the, the fifth exile. I can read it like it talks about the Zohar and everything, and I'm trying to like just put that in perspective of like I mean we've been under thousands years of like Arab conquerors and all that like is that something different from this concept of like a, of the uh, last part of the exile is the Ishmael and does it like have to run its course um, you know because of the way of, of, of that it goes right okay so you're mentioning something really really important so Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and in his dream he saw a statue and in the statue, the head was made out of gold, the arms were made out of silver, the torso was made out of copper, the legs were made out of iron, some of the toes were made out of, um, like, I don't know, it says either clay or hardened dirt, and some of the toes were made out of iron. And as a king, he felt entitled to kill all his wise men who couldn't give him a good advice. So as the executioner comes to Daniel, who was one of the um, intelligent advisors, he says to the executioner, tell the king he doesn't have to kill anyone. I will tell him what this means, what's going on. And he says, God is showing you the future. Your kingdom, Babylonia, is the gold. He was actually a very, very wise, I mean, he was a little ruthless, but he was very wise. He didn't just kill people. He took uh, the, the smart people from the different nations. He, he had a lot of kind of savvy in how he was running his government. The next nation, if anyone needs to put their phone on mute, feel free. The next nation was the nation of Persia. They took over from him. And the next nation was the nation of Greece. They took over from them. And then came the Edoim, kind of Italy, the West, descendants of Asim. Now, if you look at these metals, each one is softer than the other. Gold is actually quite soft. Silver is a little softer. Copper or brass is a little harder. And iron, if you cook your foot against iron, the iron doesn't get hurt, but you do. So what this teaches us is that these nations, they um, were going to put the Jewish people in exile. And there's a lot on this. You know, Yaakov was shown this by God, he was shown the eagle of Edom, it like rose very, very high, each one it had like 70 years, whatever, but this rose very, it was like, oh my God, is this ever going to go down? God is like, don't worry, it's going to go down. And at the end of times, amazingly, you know, the Rebbe kind of predicted this, the Rebbe said like, when people were worried about Russia and nukes, it was a whole thing, the Rebbe was like, don't worry about Russia, because everything's based on the prediction, he was like, worry about the Arabs. Now at that time, the Arabs were like these Bedouins, like who thought the Arabs would make trouble. But turns out that they were the final troublemakers of the world. Now, it's very interesting. There's a medrash. Many people don't know this. I kind of randomly saw this. It says, we went through six exiles. Each one, one is hard and one is soft. The Egyptian exile was very hard. The Babylonian was soft. The Persian with Haman was very hard. The one of Greece was soft. Alexander the Great was kind of pretty benevolent. The Roman one, the, the West, when you think about the Holocaust, was hard, but the Arab one is soft. Okay, it's been a pain in the neck, but it's not like what we suffered under European Christendom, which was bad. 
And so the point is, in the end, a stone came and smashed the statue. And the statue turned to the dust. And the dust, a wind came and blew away the dust, and the stone turned into a mountain. And the Rebbe explains what this means. Because all these empires are actually based on money and power. That's all they really want in the end of the day, like boil it down to its... Rebbe Levi Yitzchak once said, you know, to God, he says, God, if you look at the Jewish prayers in Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, all they're asking for is money. But if you look at their money, all they want to do is send their kids to yeshiva education. <laughs> so it's like if you squeeze out money and power behind it all, it was ego, right? Which is what? Low self-esteem. It's just stupid. But as we come to Mashiach, that power structure begins to disintegrate. And we're seeing this now. There's a younger generation, in fact, many in the West, that really despise war. I mean, even many in Russia, they despise what Putin is doing, which is making a war for no stupid reason, you know? So in the end of the day, we're in a time that most of the world, I would hope, but definitely a lot of the world, billions of people don't want a world based on ego. They want a good world. And that's the times of Mashiach, when that mountain, that's Mashiach that comes and brings peace. And ultimately, peace can only come when we realize that we're all pieces of the same puzzle. It's the only way to have peace. I discussed this before. We're all pieces of the same puzzle. Everybody, Jew, Gentile, tree, everything is part of the same puzzle. Puzzle, it's God's symphony, it's God's story. I call it history, it's his story. We're all part of it. And so when we get that, then we have kind of peace. Um, so... Um, I feel that we're at the very, very end. I, I feel in a certain sense with the Arab Spring. I mean, look at, I'm an American, but look, America's kind of gone down. Um, there is no real Western or power anymore. So it's like that part of the prophecy happened. And now you're looking at the Arabs and the Arabs also don't have any power anymore. You know, Israel, in fact, they were compared to hardened dirt as opposed to iron, because every time um, they would go to war, right, whether it was an Iraq war, every war against the Jews, they just get decimated. So it's like you step on dirt, it just falls apart. If Israel wanted to, in one day, literally they should do it today, they can get rid of Hamas, they could nuke the Hezbollah, they could get rid of, you know, uh, 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 or they could just go in, you know, I wouldn't nuke Syria, but I would just go and make a stand. They could do it right now. Literally, they can do it. So the story is that they just have to do it because they have to finish off this final arrogance. But generally speaking, the Arabs as a whole have actually become aligned with Israel, believe it or not. You know, in this attack with Iran, the Saudi Arabia, Jordan, they were, they were protecting Israel. So the point is that we, I would say, based on this prophecy, we're very much, the mountain of peace is growing. And um, maybe there are some some, some, actually in the book of Daniel, in the end, we've said it many times, it says that before Mashiach comes, it will become clear, good and evil, and the Rebbe speaks about how certain things are happening. You could only understand it from this prophecy, and many will return. And who could have imagined? I mean, it's a horrific thing to say, but October 7th brought millions, maybe millions of Jews to their senses. No, actually, the Western and the liberal craziness is not our friend. You know, they're, they're our enemy. Well, we're not their enemy, but they are our enemy. And anti-Semitism went away from being anti-Israel, as people said it was. You know, all, and it's anti-Semitism, just against Jewish students, full stop. That's what it is. It's anti-Semitism. And so I think that this clarity is also part of the coming of Mashiach. And so if you look at the mountain, if you look at that statue, where are we? The statue has fallen. It's basically turning to dust. And anybody that's after like a money greed based world is the minority now, certainly in the Western world. And those that want the love and peace and harmony and goodness and truth is the majority. So we're kind of there. We're in the times of Mashiach. <laughs>